It's April the 8th, 2022. I'm Chris, and this is Curious Nippona. Back with another episode of Curious Polar. I'm Chris, and this is Mario. Hello. Hello, Chris. How are you? Ah, Henry's missing. He's busy. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> he's he's he busy. Is, he, he's preparing for his next big trip, so um, I think he's excused, and we are holding up the fort until then um, with another Polar newsreel. That, uh, I'm happy that you put this together, Mario. <laughs> yeah, well... You just, it's you, a just have, you just have the much better overview of the things. Um, mm. Where do we start? Let me bring up the first story here. Um, a nice link in into the uh, into the ongoing theme of women in science and in polar exploration. Uh, you brought something up here from the Smithsonian Magazine. Yes, and um, and first of all, I think that it's nice that uh, there are these prestigious magazines that are that are covering stories of this kind. Um, and um, and then, I mean, in this one here, we have a few uh, a few mentions that are that are worth uh, thinking about. And mm -hmm. the first one, uh, because we are talking about we're talking about women in polar exploration, especially in Antarctica, and places that are named for them. I mean, these are ten uh, places that are named after women explorers or scientists, and or both. But first of all, this article mentions Ingrid Christensen, and uh, and this is uh, one person that you might not have heard of. No, I haven't. Yeah, uh, so Ingrid Christensen was the first woman uh, to uh, to sight Antarctica, and uh, or well, uh, maybe maybe she wasn't the first one to sight Antarctica because at that time she was sailing also with Mathilde Wegger, um, and that was 1931. But she was definitely the first woman to step on the continent, and um, and that was 1937. So we are talking about. 1931 for sighting Antarctica and then 1937. So in the 30s, Ingrid Christensen, she a Norwegian, uh, she was making history. Um, so yeah, interesting. Good to know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, of course it has to be said that uh, Ingrid Christensen uh, was born as Ingrid Dahl. She was from Sandefjord in Norway. She lived until 1984. And the uh, Christensen and the Dahl were two of the very rich ship owner companies in uh, uh, Sandefjord. And by marrying uh, Mr. Christensen, she actually uh, joined the two fortunes together. So they were pretty rich. And they went uh, to Antarctica. They went uh, uh, lots of places together. And uh, in 31, when she sailed to Antarctica with Mathilde Wegge, she was also sighted by Mawson. And uh, Mawson, uh, whom you might have heard in Polar Exploration, was uh, uh, actually, actually did report on seeing these women and uh, actually noting in his diary, in his logbook, that uh, he was probably... And he was right. There was the first women to go down to Antarctica and to uh, to be seen in those places. And he was kind of uh, amazed as that. Uh, but um, Christensen was also the first one to uh, fly over Antarctica, the first mm -hmm. woman to see Antarctica from the air. And uh, and and then in thirty six and the year nineteen thirty six thirty seven she made a fourth trip to Antarctica with her daughter Augusta Sophie Christensen with Lillemore Ratchlew and Solvi Vidro. So there were four women and the four ladies. And uh, there is an underwater bank that is called the Four Ladies Bank that was named under this voyage during this voyage and this is not mentioned in the article by the by the uh, smithsonian magazine but uh, it is the bonus of this article here awesome 
Um, I would like to go through quickly about these places and the women, especially the women that uh, have been uh, um, giving the names or that have been lending their name to these uh, to these places. You have the Fricker Ice Piedmont, which is in the uh, Adelaide Island on uh, the east side of Antarctica, mm-hmm. um, and it's named after the American Helen Amanda Fricker, who is a glaciologist and she's a professor at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. And she's especially uh, using satellites. Uh, She's uh, still active, of course, and uh, um, she has won many prizes uh, for uh, contributions to science and especially for the uh, understanding of uh, the... um, uh, topography of Antarctica and uh, the lakes that are uh, subglacially uh, over Antarctica. I mean, there are several lakes that are below the ice. Right. Mm-hmm. Then we go to the Russian Maria Klenova that is given the name to Klenova Peak. And uh, she was working, uh, she she's, was born in 1988, in uh, 1898. And uh, she um, is... She was one of the first marine geologists uh, or the first women marine geologists. And she has done extensive work in Antarctica's uh, seabed. And uh, she was working um, at the first Soviet Antarctic expeditions in the 50s. And uh, yeah, yeah. And she has this uh, Klenova peak. How do you get to how, how do you get to to name things? Is it is it just the right of being the first one to be somewhere and then um, is a, is or a is there a committee or something? Yeah, there is a committee for geographical names, so you have to suggest ah, uh, a name, and then it has to be approved. And of course, uh, there is a lag time for other people to claim uh, names before it has to be checked that this place has not been named before. So it's I quite see. interesting. Um, then there is a Bernasconi Cove, Ber- Irene Bernasconi, uh, Argentine, but obviously of uh, Northern Italian origin. It's a f- very common name in uh, Lombardia, for example. Mm-hmm. And she was an echinoderm specialist. So she was specializing on starfish and sea urchins and brittle stars and this. And uh, she was in the late uh, 60s at Melchior Bay's in the uh, northwest of the Antarctic Peninsula. Yeah. And she was also there uh, with uh, Maria Adela Caria, Elena Martinez Fontes for Cape Fontes and Cape Caria, of course, and Carmen Pujals and Pujals Cove. And they are all scientists, Argentinian scientists, that have given names to features. Then you remember we had uh, the first episode with the Americans going down with uh, uh, Lois Jones. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. That's, of course, uh, they have, there is a Jones Terrace in the Olympus mountain range. So that's uh, uh, Don. Uh, we have already mentioned her. Then we have Margaret Bradshaw, a New Zealander that uh, has a peak as well. And uh, uh, she... Uh, was working, she, I think she went to Antarctica in the 70s um, first, and uh, she was the first woman to lead a field party deep into the Antarctic. And she went into Ohio Range, uh, which is uh, part of the Transatlantic, Transantarctic Mountains. And she was uh, studying the uh, stratigraphy, so the uh, layers of, uh, of rocks. And uh, yeah, and she has also been awarded the Queen's Polar Medal in 1993. Yeah, and then we have uh, uh, Serap uh, Tilav. Uh, uh, I think she was. Uh, She's Turkish. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the Tilav Cirque, so a formation of rock like a cirque. And uh, uh, she um, is working out of the United States. And uh, she was working with the neutrinos. Uh, she's working with the neutrino observatory. So, you know that in Antarctica there is an observatory. Oh yeah, the ice cube. The ice cube. Yeah, which is just this cross huge, area. huge ice area that uh, they have yeah. sensors in, and uh, they try to detect uh, neutrinos mm-hmm. coming from who knows where. 
far away. away. Like it's uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but uh, in in any case, it's it's one of the observatories for mapping the universe, and uh, that's a uh, fantastic that there is uh, also here we have women doing this. It should be normal. Uh, we shouldn't we shouldn't be amazed that there are women, but it's it's actually uh, we are actually pleased that there are women. Well, given this. given the amount of visibility women have mm -hmm. lacked over the centuries, um, that is certainly uh, it's it's certainly important to. To bring them up to the light. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And then we have a Mount Fien, Fiennes. I do not know how to pronounce her name, but is Lady Virginia Twistleton Wicken, Wick, Wickham Fiennes, I think. She was an adventurer and explorer and a polar radio operator. And uh, she uh, was a uh, radio operator and maintaining a radio mast in the Arctic and the Antarctic. And, uh, and uh, she uh, has, is famous for the Transglobe expedition that uh, was uh, uh, circumnavigating the Earth ab across Antarctica and the Arctic. So not around the equator, but around the, uh, the poles, passing by the, passing by the poles. Awesome. And uh, uh, that was in the uh, late 70s, early 80s. And uh, she was also the first woman to be invited to the Antarctic Club, a uh, very exclusive British club. And um, yeah, and uh, uh, then we have uh, Francis Peak, which is named after Dame James Francis, who is the director of the British Antarctic Survey. And uh, she is also a paleobotanist and a paleoclimatologist. And uh, she is uh, one of the authors of a famous paper that has uh, demonstrated that there was abundant plant life in, uh, on Antarctica. So that Antarctica had been not only much warmer, but also very covered, densely covered with plants. And uh, then we have uh, a f two more uh, peaks or two more places. We have the Haywood Glacier, uh, by named uh, um, after the British Antarctic oceanographer Karen Haywood, that um, has uh, uh, used an, among other things, also unmanned uh, underwater robots or. Uh, and uh, like gliders that go under the uh, ice shelves, for example, and uh, uh, look for oceanographic conditions. And, uh, and this is quite uh, a new field of science. We'll talk more about this later in the episode. And then finally, we have the Pendant Cliffs and uh, uh, Irene Pendant. Pend Ped Peden uh, was a fir sorry. Pinden. Is it Peden or Penden? The, uh, the article Penden. Uh, Penden. writes it Penden. two different oh, no, ways. Penden. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, Irene Penden uh, was the first woman to spend an entire winter at the South Pole, and the first female American female scientist to both live and work in Antarctic in the interior. Wow. And she used radio waves to study the glacial ice sheets, so very low frequency radio waves. And uh, looking at the ice as kind of a kind of a radar, a geo radar, right? And uh, yeah, so so much for uh, this very nice article. I it's very inspiring, and um, we'll have of course the link uh, to this uh, Smithsonian Magazine article in our show notes. Absolutely. Next up on the list of topics is okay. Um, this is basically archaeology, and uh, the. the for for some reason, in my mind, archaeology is always uh, linked to digging in the dirt. But this is not digging in the dirt. This is some somewhere else. <laughs> well, there is some dirt involved into this one here, but it is uh, actually the story of how uh, a lost sample was found uh, in two thousand and nineteen, uh, and and it was a sample that was sampled a few years before in Greenland. And uh, it's a sample of mud. So it's not dirt, but it's mud. So it, it, was, it is mud, but it is yeah. in a place where archaeology for me looks more like 
the, the yeah. desert somewhere in the Middle East where you try to find old ruins and things. That's yeah, not the or kind a, of archaeology you're looking the, for. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Finding dinosaur fossils. Well, in this case, uh, there was a place uh, called Camp Century in uh, in Greenland. So in the northwest of Greenland, um, I think uh, we have a Wikipedia article that shows where the uh, where Camp Century is. Um, Camp Century was a place that the there was both a military and a research installation. Uh, it was built in in northwest Greenland, close to the Tule Air Base, um, by digging tunnels, by dig digging trenches, and covering them with a, a metal roof. So by making these trenches and the longest of these i think it was about 300 meters long this uh, trench so they made this uh, the the us um, military build this uh, camp uh, this under under the ice practically because of course once you put the the roof there is snow forming on top uh, or depositing on top of the or the roof or the metal roof and then it's covered and this is uh, a site that is famous because there was uh, especially um, a um, a portable nuclear reactor a, an mm. remotely built and in in pieces and and then taken over there and assembled and it powered this uh, Camp Sentry in the early 60s for so, like, three years. So Camp Sentry is a military base, pretty much. It's a military base, and it was made as part of a uh, an attempt to. It, it was never, it was never used for weapons, but uh, at least as far as we know. And here we have the uh, we have the scheme of this, uh, like the map on on screen of. That's quite Camp extensive. Was, it's it's it bigger than extensive. I expected it to be. Yeah, it was quite a lot of people working out there. I don't remember how many, but uh, several hundreds, and uh, and it was made so that uh, one would place uh, under the ice, so in a in a in a hidden position. Uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles that could then reach Russia. At that time, uh, in in those years, the missiles didn't have that larger range, and the, the closest you would get to the enemy, like we are talking about the Cold War, so it's a it's a Russia versus United States uh, arms right. race, and there you have the ICBMs placed very close to the Russian territory. If they were then uh, to be place in, in Greenland. So and having these uh, these locations under the ice would make them hidden and, and very close to uh, to Russia. But uh, there were, according to what we know, there were never uh, nuclear uh, weapons up there um, and uh, like stationed and that would have required of course uh, the approval of the Danish government and other things that didn't happen. But to go back to our story here is that this camp century was also used as a scientific base. And there we have one of the first, if not the first, uh, ice core. There are several ice cores that have been made in Greenland and in this map on the PINAS, so in the, uh, in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. We have a, a series of places, and here in the northwest Greenland we have the first ice core. And this ice core went not only through several hundreds uh, meters of ice, but also hit the bottom, the mm. what's under the ice, the subglacial surface. And so this is where the mud comes in pretty much. Yes. And that's where there was a sample of mud. Now we're talking about the 60s here. Then the uh, analysis of the ice uh, core was made and the mud was put in a box and then was placed, I think, in Denmark and uh, and forgotten. And in 2019, somebody just was clearing up a, a storage <laughs> place and found I this Found mud. it lying behind a shelf somewhere. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what is interesting here is that this mud actually, and now I'm making a short, a long story very short and a complicated story very short. <laughs> this mud can be dated 
and also the the rocks under the ice can be dated so you can or it, not not that the rock can be dated but the time at which they were last exposed to the atmosphere to the to right. the radiation from the from the from the universe uh, like uh, from the atmosphere can be dated by looking at the ratio between the uh, isotopes of aluminum and beryllium mm, i get it yeah and uh, and so when last they were hit by the solar radiation, for example. And this means that this mud can be actually dated. Because it's like it's like rock, like mineral, you look at these mm, sure. isotopes and and it can be dated. And we're talking about mud that is uh between two and a half million years and eleven thousand years old. So this sediment covers, this spans this whole period. That is the actual the, the ice age, what we call the last ice age. And uh, and there are of course several interglacial periods in the last ice age. And the scientists that have analyzed these samples here have first of all found out that the uh, Greenland ice sheet had uh, uncovered this area. Uh, so the England Greenland ice sheet had retreat, uh, retreated and uncovered this area at least twice in this period, in this uh, in this period of two and a half million years, and that there were uh, plants, and so they found actually remains of plants, several remains of plants that you can see in the article by the proceeding of the National Academy of Sciences. You see the pieces of uh, of wood and uh, and seeds twigs and, and stuff, yeah, and twigs and things, and and these actually resemble quite a lot uh, to uh, a tundra ecosystem. So by looking at this, this mud sample, we have now, a, a um, at least in the last glaciation period, so in, the, uh, in this uh, nice uh, long glaciation period, we find the, um, uh, the story of the ice sheet, and especially when the ice core uh, when the when the ice uh, sheet actually retreated and exposed the ground so it's um and uh yeah so so what we uh, learn from this is what we learn from this is kids it's okay to not tidy up and uh lose and <laughs> lose and <laughs> lose a lose a core every now and then because later on yes. it might come in handy later on somebody will tidy up for you after you well <laughs> let's not say this to the kids anyways but uh, but it is also very important to notice that it is very difficult to have samples of the uh, sediment that is under the ice i mean here in this case we are talking about 1.4 kilometers of ice and this is a sediment that is underneath this that's a long way down yeah <laughs> yeah so so that's uh, that's quite a long way down so Quite, um, quite a quite a story, and uh, very nice. And especially uh, now they are looking at uh, how the changes from a, a glacial cover, a, a glaciation, can happen from a glacial cover to no ice on the surface. Right. How quickly they can come. Ah. <sighs> so next quite, up, quite interesting. Sorry. Yes. Um, next up on the next newsreel up. is uh, a beast. How about a beast? Yeah, and we mentioned the underwater robots, and I was talking about the women. I remember the penguin. The you know, yeah. the, the you penguin You mentioned also one. the penguin, the penguin shape, and this is this is also part of German technology. This is a from the magazine from EOS, which is the uh, uh, magazine from the American Geological Union. Um, and it's a little bit old because it's from the uh, December 2020, but it's uh, before the uh, um, well, it's during the mosaic expedition uh, with the Polarstern frozen in the Arctic ice, and and this is about a an underwater unmanned vehicle that can actually go under the ice for a year, practically. Uh, what? Yeah, a year exactly. It as is. in, as in, is it is it linked to wires on land? Does it get no. power from a? No, it's completely no. autonomous. It's totally autonomous, and it can do a lot of sampling and a lot of measures. And uh, in uh, this uh, article, this uh, remotely operated vehicle, I mean, it can receive instructions when it ah, comes I see. to uh, uh, to um, to the um, 
yeah closer to uh, to the uh, to the base. Uh, but uh, it was uh, first of all they they tried to put this vehicle under the ice and to map the ice from underneath. So you know, like you can make a laser scanning oh, yes. of a of a surface of a house or something. Well, this uses uh, echo sounding, but the other way around. So looking up. And looking at how thick the ice is, and what are the, f- the the what is the surface of the ice under the an ice flow? So it looks like a mountain yeah. landscape, but upside down. Yeah, exactly. So in this article, there are there is also a little video that shows that shows this, and there are pictures of what you can what you can find, and it's uh, uh, actually quite a uh, quite a quite a nice uh, quite a nice tool to do, and uh, also you can sample ice. And uh, so look at the early ice formations. It's uh, that's one of those uh, things that, of course, like uh, people that like toys. <laughs> well, you know, this is this is the interesting thing. I mean, the the whole field of drones, and we're not talking drones in the air, but that whole field is drones are everywhere now, and they yeah. are a really good way for us to virtually go to places that we couldn't go before or that were too dangerous to go before and they they, they're not they're they're not only doing interesting science they're also pretty much saving lives because it is uh dangerous to get to some of these places yes and you know and also and also it's uh it's difficult to have a continuous record of what's happening uh, under the ice and and now this uh, beast as it was called uh could do uh like uh, has done this this uh, in 2020 had done like 300 hours of continuous recording it's crazy uh, uh under the ice so like looking also like with video at uh, the uh, movement of polar cod, for example, the uh, krill um, formation of algae, um, formation of the ice. It's an extremely, extremely interesting, uh, interesting tool and uh, very useful, and very visual as well. Really, really nice. Very good. So, so this is really, really good. But um, and this is why I put also the next article, which is about using a different technique. <laughs> it's a kind of drone, isn't it? It's well, kind of drone, but it, it's it's very autonomous. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's the most autonomous drone we have, and it's a it's alive. Yeah, and uh, it's about uh, this is also like relatively old news. It's uh, it's um, about uh, a, a, how Jap- Japanese researchers have been using seals to collect the data under the Antarctic ice, and we're talking about a project that was carried out in 2017 in Antarctica. And uh, these Japanese researchers have put uh, satellite tags or satellite dive recorders on the head of uh, Weddell seals. Looks, looks like a hat on on the head of it. Why wouldn't wouldn't the seal hate hate that on its head, or does it? Uh, not well, well, I don't think. Well, I think that uh, probably they would rather not have it. But um, yeah, these are these are relatively small. Uh, satellite dive recorders like if you look at it here these are made by the uh sea mammal research uh, by smooth limited so they are made by the sea mammal research unit I okay think these units here you have on the on the front you have an antenna sticking out towards the front so they are, they are placed on the head of a seal and you can see there is a mesh the mesh is used for uh gluing for attaching the glue to the fur of the seal so you use um, epoxy glue Two component epoxy glue to to uh, to attach this to the head of the seal and to the uh, to the fur. This means that when the seal molts, say once a year, yeah, you lose the you lose the the you lose seal pretty much, yeah. And, and so the the seal is free. So like you 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 don't retrieve the seal again. Uh, in this case, you don't have to retrieve the seal again because the antenna that is sticking out from the front is actually communicating with satellites. With Argus satellites, and these can not only determine the position by using a Doppler effect in the uh, in the transmission, uh, but they can also receive packets of data. So there is mm. an onboard processing of some data that is gathered at the far end of uh, the tail end of the transmitter. When you look at the seal, you have a big battery, a D cell battery. And in the top, there is kind of a dome, like a, 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 
how do you call it, black dome there, and mm -hmm. there is a, um, a speed sensor. So like water speed sensor. So when the seal moves, it can then uh, measure the speed of movement. But inside the actual box, there is a, there are accelerometers, three axis accelerometers, so they can see how the seal is actually placed. And you can, for example, infer uh, the how fat the seal is by looking at uh, the variation in the movement and also in the angle at which the seal swims. If the seal is fatter, it's, it, it's, it, it swims more with the head towards the, the bottom <laughs> because it would tend to float. And, uh, and then there is also a temperature sensor and a conductivity sensor. So uh, it is kind of a, a CTD, a conductivity, depth, and uh, temperature sensor that uh, uh, then can collect oceanographic data and send them back. So what, what, what are we looking or what are the scientists looking for? Is that to, uh, to get information about what is going on down there or is it more about the seal yeah. behavior that they're interested in? This is actually probably, and I can speak of, uh, of personal experience, it is um, seal biologists, they don't have a lot of money. And in this case, they associate with oceanographers and say, okay, let's split the cost of doing this thing and do something fun. We put an instrument that is useful for getting data about the seal's behavior, but also about oceanography. So the seal, the Weddell seals, they have an ice... An, 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 in the winter, they will have a hole in the ice and they would come back to this hole and dive under the ice to find big fish and come back to the same hole. When they are diving, they are going for tens of minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes down under the ice and, and they are swimming in all sorts of different areas that are very difficult to reach unless you have a beast like the one that we had before. Mm -hmm, the beast right. needs recharging while a seal doesn't need recharging. It needs a couple of... Well, it needs they, fish. They are, they are recharging. <laughs> yeah, there is recharging, but they do it themselves. They don't. Yep. You don't need to do anything once you put the satellite... self-recharging underwater drone, so to speak. Yes, exactly. But this is just the one, I mean, there are several groups, I mean, these are Japanese, but there are several groups that are have been using this uh, technique uh, for getting oceanographic data and uh, also getting behavior, behavioral data on the seals and also like body conditions. And, and I understand that this goes back a while. This is not just yeah. uh, happening now. Well, uh, Jerry Kuiman in the 60s had mounted the first dive recorder this is just a dive recorder on the head of also a Weddell seal and here you can see in this article that you can retrieve from uh, the uh, um, uh, uh, what's it called uh, help me here what is the uh, it's research gate uh, yeah oh yeah get it through there yes uh, and uh, and this article is showing the mechanical recorder hmm that Jerry Kuhlman was using at that time. And that was a very big box. It was also glued to the head of the seal. Uh, early versions had straps. But this was a box that originally had a blackened glass, like, you know, like you use a candle to blacken the glass, mm -hmm. with a needle that would scratch the glass and because because you need something you need something to oh scribe it into the into the suit on the glass the, pretty much the suit on the glass you would scribe <laughs> this and it will be um, uh, wound like uh, like you know like a kitchen timer with yes. uh, with a metal uh, spring and in the uh, the glass or the needle would they would move at a constant speed right and Isn't that the needle would be moving according to the depth. So you'd use like an aneroid, like a barometer, right. uh, squishing aneroid. Isn't that amazing? I mean, the, the, the microelectronics, I mean, the, the, the today's science seals have it so much better in terms of the, the weight they oh, carry yeah. on the heads and everything. Exactly. Um, interesting development. Wow. So so now now we use of course electronics and everything is miniaturized and things and of course there are also lots of um, heavy metals and other things in the in the uh, in these tags that maybe we should be doing something about like making these tags more environmentally friendly. 
but uh, definitely i mean what is called biologging so logging the behavior of an animal is nothing very new i mean it's something that's been going on for quite a quite a while and this with the mechanical death the time death recorders is is amazing and and they did it because you needed of course it had no satellite to come back to 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 retrieve the data so you needed to get the animal again so what they did they captured a Weddell seal they took it inland or inland on you know the you have the ice shelf so they took it far away from the edge of the ice shelf the ice edge in a place where they were sure that the seal would not be able to swim any she would not be able to or the animal would not be able to escape to the open sea so it would when it would come up again it would have to come to the same hole so they they dug a hole way away from the from the ice edge and they put this poor seal there and and the seal actually yeah they uh they had uh they had no problem in finding fish and and they survived uh, this experiment that's crazy that was a, a crazy, crazy thing, thing. Yep. yeah but it was very innovative in the 60s jerry kuiman all right yep. So let's End. close out this yes. polar newsreel with a, with a bit of a meta topic because the yeah. question is why are we so uh, fascinated and obsessed with yes. uh, the whole polar exploration thing? What does what 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 is the yeah. reason for that? This is this is an article from the Guardian and is written by uh, Imogen West Knights and she's a. Uh, she's a, like a, a journalist and a writer and she is actually uh taking us through a little thought experiment or, or like uh, in on the occasion of the shackleton uh, on the finding on the endurance and uh, and uh, and all this uh, that uh, all these events that we have talked about in the previous episodes let me say like why are we fascinated by polar exploration and especially why are we fascinated but about all these things that have not succeeded or like you know like the, the it's, tragedy it's not, pretty much <laughs> yeah it's it's not that these polar explorers i mean she's she's pointing out for example that it's not that these polar explorer had a, a huge success like we we idolize shackleton but i mean he had success in coming back alive at least his this part of the expedition all of them came back alive and then they died during the war and, and all this, <laughs> but uh, a lot of them died during the war, but, but it is a heroic uh, expedition, but they didn't, they didn't achieve the goal that they were set, that they set out to do. And, and still we are uh, actually fascinated by it. Then she, she mentions the um, Franklin's expedition through the Northwest Passage, like Franklin uh, last expedition, with the Erebus and the Terror, and the ships have also now recently been found. I also mentioned this, and uh, um, and he like nobody came back from that, and and she mentions that she was listening to uh, to Stan Rogers' uh, song folk songs about Northwest Passage and about like and 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 how she was moved by this song, and it's just like amazing. I mean, you have this, you fascinated by Scott. Of course, we are also fascinated by Amundsen, by by Nansen. But if we if we want to, I mean, maybe maybe not for a Norwegian, but uh, but for <laughs> for for the rest of the world, I mean, people say, yeah, okay, Amundsen, yeah, great, he he was first at the South Pole, yeah, great explorer like this. But but Shackleton, I mean, especially for the for the Anglo-Saxon world, is like it's an amazing is, story. Yeah, exactly. Uh, then there are, of course, the, she mentions the uh, the Belgica expedition about the horror stories of hunger and being down in Antarctica on this uh, ship and people going crazy and uh, yeah. So we are fascinated by these expeditions, in spite of them not bringing back anything, but at best bringing back geographical knowledge i mean okay yeah being the first of the south pole like, yeah great i mean but, is it is it what, something what does that make for humanity <laughs> yeah is it is it about uh, just just humanity being explorers and uh, just thriving on going to where no man has gone before and no woman has gone before or is it that we need heroes i I don't know. I mean, there must be there must be something 
also inside the persons that are doing this. And oh, yeah. possibly not everybody has it. But Chris, you have been up in Svalbard. You have seen what, what it looks like. Would you like to go back there again? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So and is, I mean, they, they call it like the polar bacillum that you, you are getting the polar bug. And, and then you want to, like some people get it and they all they think about is going back to the pole or maybe moving to Trump as well. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, my, my motivation is, I have like five different motivations for it. So it's not the one single thing for me. But um, yeah, I wonder what, is it, is it possible to boil this down to something very specific or is it just the, our general longing for um for the unknown and yeah I, and to I conquer wonder. the unknown maybe i, I don't think, know i think that uh, it, it seems to me it uh, it resonates with uh, what my I, it was it was another generation of course but my, my grandmother uh, like her father was working uh, in africa uh, between the two world wars and uh, and um and she was talking often about this uh, Africa bug, like you know, uh, in Italian it's called the Mal d'Africa, and it's like yeah, you would go back to Africa again if you'd been to Africa, and and I suppose that for some people, I mean, this is quite a real thing. I mean, you go to a place, you get so fascinated, you want to go back there, and you want to know more about it. But even just by going there and just sitting and enjoying the place, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so yeah. I thought that it was uh, it was an, a nice little uh, piece, uh, reflective for people that have been uh, these places, and also for people that have not been there to try to understand why people are so fascinated, why some persons are so fascinated by the unknown of these and desolation of these places. I mean, this is this is different from Africa. I mean, there is a place where there is very little visible life and it's very hostile to to animal and plant life so. well and i guess i guess that that's where we come in because we are uh, trying to at least give you a glimpse into these areas and try to um, take you with us on those trips at least trips of the mind and uh, explore things out there that um you might not be able to do just now so um, that is it for this week's episode of Grizzly Polar. We are going to be back soon with more. And you can find us online at curiouslypolar.com. All the other episodes will be back soon. Until then, everyone, take care.